Okay. So we had started the topic of freeze tracing and freeze tracing concrete in the last class. Any questions? If not, we'll go straight to this question. What are the advantages of pre stressing? In other words, advantages of pre stressed concrete over reinforced concrete. Yes? Yeah, getting less section of the concrete. We are we can manage with smaller section sizes, the great in beams. Then more tension in concrete. So does it mean it's more economical? Why not? Less concrete. More height and size less strength. See, typic, see, you should understand the applications. The applications of many pieces of concrete, but long span bridges, box girder bridges, they're classical pieces of concrete applications. This course is more buildings related, but you can use it in flat slabs, flat plates, long beams. But bridges can be very long, 40 meters, 50 meters. There you will find that in a long span bridge, unlike a short span bridge, the self weight is the main load. Your vehicular load effects are much less than the self weight. There, you get a tremendous gain if you can manage with a lighter cross-section because your overall stresses are much less. So it is more economic, but not always. Because as you rightly said, uh, this needs equipment, specialized uh, supervision. So that's the trade-off between reinforced concrete. But this concrete is now becoming more and more common. So could be economical in some situations, right? Okay, what else? You can make use hold width for tensile load carry capacity. Huh? You can make use hold width for tensile load carry capacity. The tensile load carry capacity of hold width will increase. Not? Can you put it another way? What you are saying is true, but can you say it differently? Concrete doesn't have much tensile load carrying capacity. We are indirectly using by putting places. Uh, not really. You are not getting into that domain at all. You are staying in compression, but you can go up to cracking. So we we talk of type one, type two, type three places. In type one, there's no residual tension. In type two. There is residual tension, but it's not yet cracked. There, what you say has value. In type 3, it is cracked, but the crack widths are controlled. So, to some extent, yes, but that's not a main advantage. Let me put it differently. Reinforced concrete beams crack, for sure they crack. But when you do your finite element analysis on the software to find out the bending moments and shear forces and action forces, etc., you don't account for the stiffness degradation due to cracking. Right? You don't. In precious concrete, will you? have that situation. If it's uncracked, the uncracked section has many advantages. What are they? What are they? Yeah? So you can retain on the also. You can retain? You can use the tanks and the works. Okay. That's a separate thing. You can use it for water tanks, he says. Yeah, but for normal buildings itself, uncracked section is good. Why? The section is already. Infections are low, then? The steel is not exposed to atmosphere. 
less corrosion. Yes. Okay. We'll go through these. Any other advantages? Higher movement of inertia. Higher movement of inertia. Well, it depends. Uh, higher movement because it's not cracked, but the RC beam may have more depth and it could have a higher moment. But yes, for the same depth, our crack section will have higher moment of inertia. Yes. What else? Entire cross section will be used. Entire cross section is being used. That's a very good advantage. That's part of the uncracked section. Because otherwise anything below the neutral axis which is cracked, you're wasting. Yes. Then why do we provide in reinforced concrete? We might well remove all that concrete. Why waste so much of concrete? Yes? Give me a correct answer. To maintain the ceiling position. To maintain the ceiling position, you can keep other things to maintain it. You can put some steel hangers and hold it in position. No, there's one fundamental reason. Because it is not for, no. for bond. For bond. But you can do clever things which have been done in bridges. That is, you can have a white flange on top for compression, a narrow web, and then you can widen it again at the bottom to accommodate your steel. But in buildings, we don't do all that because that needs a lot of shuttering. And, but in bridges, you can. Okay. Any more advantages? What about dynamic behavior? Dynamic behavior. Uh, can you give me a common application of of uh, precious concrete railway sleepers, rail track sleepers? Right. So, why is the precious concrete sleeper preferred to reinforce concrete sleeper? By the way, do you know that? In India, those sleepers, the first designs came from IIT Madras, from this lab, 1960. We ourselves got it from German sleeper design. Even today, we do a lot of sleeper redesigns. Why? No, there the uncracked section is particularly useful find that first if it cracks you've got exposure and uh, to moisture to corrosion to carbonation and those sleepers will have very little life you can see it in lampos itself you know, inside this campus itself yeah well, the bars corrode very quickly when they expose but more important you'll find that this has much better resistance to fatigue behavior so whenever a train runs over it, there is a jolt up and down. So better resist fatigue. So there are many such reasons. Let's go through them. Firstly, the section remains uncracked under service load. At extreme loads, it surely will crack. Reduction of steel corrosion, increase in durability. The full section is utilized. You said uh, that was the correct point made. Higher moment of inertia, higher stiffness compared to RC, less deformation, improved serviceability. Increase in shear capacity, uncracked section. Suitable for use in pressure vehicles, vessels, liquid retaining structures. That has, that has not so much to do with increase in shear capacity. That's a in separate point by itself. Okay. You'll find especially circular tanks in precious concrete are very popular, especially in the US. See, a circular tank is subject to the hoop tension. And so the concrete is useless there. The entire tension is taken by the steel. But the concrete is totally useful if it is pre-stressed. That's called circular pre-stress. Improved performance under dynamic and fatigue loading, resilience. You can achieve high span to depth ratios, which is the first point made. Larger spans possible with pre stressing in bridges, buildings with large column free spaces. Typical span to depth ratios in slabs, 
simply supported. Our, in non free states, RC slab is 28 is to 1. You know that. But in Greece, it's concrete. You can go almost half that slab. It's almost slightly more. 45 is to 1. These are some typical values. For the same span, less depth compared to the RC members, you have a reduction in self weight. It looks much better. The aesthetic, and sometimes more economic. This is a great tool. It's used very good for precast construction. Precast itself has uh, has got many advantages. You can make buildings, components much faster, rapid. Better quality control because you're doing it in a, a, in a lab, controlled conditions. We did an airport recently, uh, a runway over the Adyar River. I think it's the second largest runway in Asia. Over the river, Adyar River. And we used a 20 meter span precious concrete girders and 10 meter span precious concrete they were they were pretensions. So there was a casting yard. In fact, an earlier batch of students we took while the construction was going on. We used M60 grade concrete. We did steam curing. Uh, it was very interesting. So we had to design the the bed for pre-stressing. And we used a long line method where you could pull and cast three beams in one go, each 20 meters span. Cut them and use them. Right? So you can ensure quality because it's done under. It's see, quality is difficult to ensure, especially in inaccessible regions where there's nobody there to supervise. You can climb up, but in a lab, in a casting yard, you have many people to check. You can check many variables. You can control the quality much better. So that's the advantage. This reduce maintenance. Crack free. And nowadays, uh, in spite of this, corrosion is still a problem. You know, carbonation always takes place. So we leave, uh, there's a preference now for external pre stressing, and we leave slots. So in case you want to strengthen the bridge at some point later, it, it's easy to, to do that. Suitable for repetitive construction. Multiple use of form work. So you save on form work cost. And you can actually you can buy precious concrete beam much much the same way as you can buy a rolled steel section. I beam you can buy precious concrete. So those are the good that's the good news. What's the bad news? Always there's a bad flip side to everything, no? People who want to sell will only show you the the positive, the, the positive things. Even the most beautiful vase will be seen to be full of cracks when looked under a magnifying lens. But here you don't need a magnifying lens. You can straight away say and there are shortcomings. What are the shortcomings? Great. Great. Creep is there in reinforced concrete also, but why is creep a concern here? Look at glasses. Yeah, but you're supposed to design for it, no? You're a designer. Don't creep about creep and all. You take care of it in the design. It's very interesting that you say. Wait, wait, let me just... Uh, in the beginning when structures were built, they were mostly statically determinate structures, right? People didn't build statically indeterminate structures for various reasons. Even bridges, bridges were all simply supported. In India, most of the bridges continue to be simply supported. They're not continuous. Why is this reluctance in the early days and even now to build, to go for indeterminate structures. What's the first reason? Statically indeterminate structures, continuous beams. Why? That's right. 
but don't tell this to the public. So we don't know how to analyze that sales. So it's a creep, it's a problem, not for the public, for me, because I don't know how much loss of this is. So that's, that's it. Knowledge deficiency. So people really didn't know how to do analysis of indeterminate structures. That's why structures are not statically determined or indeterminate. This definition is being made from the perspective of the analyst who has to analyze the structure. Structure doesn't know whether it's determinate or indeterminate, it's just a structure. And the indeterminacy comes from making it over rigid, over constrained. <coughs> so we blame the structure, but poor structure is just there. You gave it more supports than you needed to, which which has many advantages. But Today, that disadvantage is no longer there because we know how to deal with statically indeterminate structures. Still, you have to be careful to go for statically indeterminate structures. Why? Especially in, in bridges. Ah, you have problems that you have to anticipate. Differential settlements <laughs> will induce a redistribution of stresses in the structure which you have to anticipate. Then, temperature effects can also cause that. Errors in construction can create problems. So there are other reasons which are construction related, but a designer has to anticipate. Yeah, so what are the limitations? You only need skilled labor, obviously. But let's say you're a small time contractor who, who You've got a mixer. First of all, you don't do high strength concrete. You need high strength concrete here. You need skilled labor. You need technology to to uh, pull the wires, to lock them, to anchor them. They shouldn't be slip. So you need skill. Agree? Then, huh? Sometimes less economical because of these reasons. Then, well, that depends on situation, but by and large it is true. Then, okay, you need skilled technology, hence it's not as popular as reinforced concrete. Use of high strength material is costly. M60 grade concrete is not easy to make. You see, there's a, there's an advantage in prescribing high strength concrete or even high performance concrete, I mean, you put it. The advantage is the contractor is forced to bring in skill. Otherwise, he can do any mix he wants and get away with it. You understand? And you have to control the water especially. Water con content is important in workability, water cementation. There is additional cost in the auxiliary equipment. <coughs> There's a need for quality control and inspection. Yes. So basically all this is covered in skip. Now we go to the next topic. Types of pre-stress. It depends on different categories. One, it depends on the source of the pre-stress. We've looked into this. This classification is based on the method by which the pre-stressing force is generated. There are four sources. Mechanical, you actually pull it. Hydraulic, you use a jack to pull it. Electrical, you could even pull it using electricity, not very popular. Chemical was popular in Russia, not much. So these are more of historical, most it's mechanical and hydraulic. Then you have to decide whether it's external pre-stressing or internal pre -stressing. What's the difference between external and internal? Mechanical pre-stressing pre only means, let's say you, similarly, uh, you've done compression testing of concrete cylinders, right? You, you normally would have done it using a jack, right? And mostly it is load controlled. Is there another way of loading your specimen deformation control with a simple mechanical device? To, to help you understand mechanical. How? 
tells to the ratio. That's right. That we have one in a lab. Very simple. You put your specimen there. You have a wheel which you can rotate. One turn is so much movement. So you keep, say one turn is 0.2 mm or 0.5 mm. So you know, so you are doing deformation control and you, it's mechanical. So you can bring ingenious ways of doing mechanical. Okay. External, internal is when it's embedded in the nerve. External is when it's outside. Classification based on the location of the precessing tendon with respect to the concrete section inside or outside. And then you already know you can have a classification based on whether it's pre or post tensioning. This is the most important classification and is based on the sequence of casting of concrete and applying tension. We looked into this. Linear or circular? Mostly it is linear, but in water tanks, for example, you have circular. the shape of the member, full, limited or partial pre-stress. Can someone explain this? Partial pre-stress? Partial pre-stressing is the type 3 classification, where uh, it's a combination of reinforced concrete and pre-stress concrete even under service loads. And you, if you find most Western codes have only one code for structural concrete today, ACI code, one code. In that, mostly, so your plain concrete, your reinforced concrete, and precious concrete, one code. India is also moving in the, that direction, but we inherited from the Britishers two codes, one for plain and reinforced concrete, IS-456. I is 1343-4 for precious concrete. Similarly, the bridge codes were also separate, but now they are all combined into IRC 112. So the trend is to have only one code. And if you cover partially precious concrete, you covered everything. You covered everything. Right. Based on the amount of pre-stressing force, three types are defined. Type 1 is fully pre-stressed. I mean, it's really a pre-stressed concrete section. We'll study this in detail later. Type 2, so no cracking. Type 2, but even type 1 at the limit, that's under service load. At the limit stage, you must meet the extreme load condition, the factor load condition. There, you'll have to rely on after cracking, it's going to behave like reinforced concrete. So you have to rely on additional non precious steel to take care of the ultimate moment capacity. In type 2, you allow it to crack, uh, you allow it to get into tension, but the modulus of rupture should not be exceeded. So it's still uncracked, but you are allowing tension. The first one is no tension. The third is you allow cracking and you make up with reinforcing steel. That's partial. Uniaxial, biaxial or multiaxial, what's the meaning of this? Uniaxial is in a beam, you pull in one direction. Biaxial, slabs. Two-way slabs. Sometimes one-way slabs. Multiaxial, well in domes and all you can. Huh? And you know there have been failures during pre-stressing. The Kaiga dome failure. You heard of it? Nuclear reactor. Where are nuclear people here? How did it fail? It's a famous failure. We had an MS student who did a thesis on that. Who was working for for uh, NPC. Uh, NPC. So there you have the possibility of delamination. When you pull, uh, especially when something is curved, it presses against the hardened concrete and the concrete can, can separate out. So, so there are, you have radial tension developing which you have to design. 
some pictures. Maybe we'll plan a visit. This is not a priestess concrete course, so maybe your priestess concrete. How many of you are taking priestess concrete elective? So it's a repetition for you. Uh, so it's worth visiting uh, a factory. This factory makes a lot of devices. They make priestess concrete poles, lighting poles, masks. They also produce racetrack sleepers. Uh, this is a classic uh, box girder. I'll end. There are a lot of pictures. We'll come to that later. I'll end with uh, some snapshots on how grouting is done, just to give you a feel. So let's say you have a curved tendon like this. When will you have a curved tendon like this? Where on top? What is the ideal profile of the tendon? What should it match? Bending moment diagram. Why we'll discuss later. So when will you get a bending moment which is similar to this? Well, no, in a continuous beam, actually you'll have a moment diagram like that, no hogging. And this side will be sagging. We'll see all this a little later, if time permits. So you need to grout this. So the suggestion given in the code is first you clean clean the grout. You have openings here called bent pipes. You blow compressed air and you clean it. Then you fill it with water for a good reason. Then you start pumping in the grout. The grout is a cementitious grout which will solidify very quickly. So you it's fluid form. So you pump it in from both sides and then you'll find that this water will come out. And at two ends you can block it and then you watch what's happening here. You'll find that this starts giving a cementitious color, the water. But you'll have an air block here. So what you do then is you block, you stop the grouting here and you grout only from one side and then you can even this block there will go. It's worth seeing all this in actual practice. Just, just to give you an example of this lot of construction detail in increases concrete technology. So with that, we have finished the module A, and we'll quickly go to module B: uh, behavior of concrete under uniaxial and multiaxial states of stress. Sir, yep. when you do external piece stressing, will we give any protection? For the you have to give protection to the tendons because they will get uh, exposed. So you will find that there is a PVC sheath which, which comes there. But the beauty of that is you can always monitor it. The problem with internal pre-stressing is you don't know the state of corrosion itself. So external is superior from corrosion monitoring point. Good. So let's look at basic things which you already said. Something about delamination. Yeah. For external pre-stressing, is there kind of... External, there's no contact with the concrete, so there's no question of delamination. Strengthening. Ah, uh, let's look at examples of external pre -stressing. Since you raised the issue, let's talk more about it. I wonder if you've seen how we are able to test in our lab loads up to 600 tons. Let's say you had to create a facility to, to apply compressive or tensile loads of 1,000 tons, 10,000 kilonewton. Will you have to design the foundations to take that load? Then you need good, strong foundation, you need strong soil, you may need a big Raft, or is there a clever way you can avoid it? This is where you need to bring in skill in engineering understanding. The reaction should be self-developed. Self-developed. So you need to develop a self-straining system where it's self-equilibrating. And I want you to think about it. It's very important. And so that. It's all locked in within that frame and nothing goes to the foundation. That's a classic example of So you use high tensile rods which are always in 
pre-tension and they get into compression but you'll still have residual tension so otherwise they'll buckle. That's what we do in our lab. Take a look and start observing structures from now. How are they working? What is the force flow? So we, when you say external pre-stressing, don't think we use it only for pre-stressed concrete. We use it for many things. You understand? Because the fundamental concept, the premise of pre-stressing is you want to counteract some stress which is opposite of the kind that is likely to come on it, like the bicycle spoke. Behavior of concrete, let's start with basics. We talked of two types of standard specimens, the cube, which is 150 mm by 150 mm by 150, and the cylinder. We are familiar with this. Which will have more strength, the cube or the cylinder? Let's say you put the same mix in both and you test them both under uniaxial compression. Which will give you the... And we are talking of... When we say strength, we are talking of the ultimate stress which is load divided by cross-sectional area. P divided by A. Obviously the area will be different for a square and a cylinder. But that you take care of. P divided by A, uniaxial stress will be more in which Huh? Cube. 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 Sure. Why? Standardless fish. Huh? Standardless fish. Ah, right. See, these are standard answers bad students give, or students who have been exposed to bad learning. What is the slenderness ratio? When do we talk of slenderness ratio? When do we talk of slenderness ratio? When you are talking of... Any of you taking stability of structures elective? Then there you talk of, uh, uh, take an RC member, you studied RC column. <coughs> RC column is slender, when? Depends. When is it slender? L by D ratio. L by D ratio is? Greater than 12. Greater than 12, some rough rules, right? What is the L by D ratio of this first? <coughs> two. Two. Where is two and where is two. 12? Compare the next one. Wait, 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 wait. wait. When the L by D ratio is less than 3, it's called a? It's called a pedestal. So where is the question of buckling? We have to we have clarity here. Where is 12 and where is 2? You see, 2 is smaller than 12, so it's more. And 2 is greater than 1, so it's, no, but that doesn't bring in slenderness effect. What is slenderness effect? That's another fundamental. What is slenderness effect in a column, in a compression member? It has lateral buckling. What is slenderness effect? Without reaching its ultimate composition, it fails. It fails due to what? Not necessarily. Then the codes will not allow you to do slender columns. So, slenderness also you have categories. Mildly slender, moderately slender, highly slender. It's a highly slender columns that are likely to fail by buckling and they will not reach their material strength. Highly slender. And the code prevents you from designing these by imposing slenderness limits on your column. L by D, 60, 30 for braced, unbraced, you know that. So don't talk of buckling. Wait, let's finish the topic. So between L by D, 12 and 30 or 60, you have moderately slender or lightly slender. They don't buckle, but they have slenderness effects for which you have to design. What are those slenderness effects? Have you seen Charlie Chaplin leaning on a cane? Have you seen Charlie Chaplin first? Some movies you've seen. He always has a cane and he leans against it. What's the shape of the cane? It's bent. Right? It's bent because it's very slender. But it's stable. It's not yet unstable. It's bent. 
when you have an additional curvature due to slenderness, you have slenderness effects. You have additional bending moments which are called P delta moments. P Except into delta whole. because you have equilibrium in the deformed configuration which gives you an additional moment. So you normally do your analysis in the undeformed configuration. That's called primary analysis. You don't do secondary analysis because secondary analysis is equilibrium in the deformed configuration. It's also called non-linear geometrical effects. Got it? So as long as those slenderness effects are negligible, that means it doesn't deflect much, you don't get additional curvature due to slenderness effect, you can ignore them. That's why you will never get them here. Why? If you measure the lateral movement, it will be symmetric everywhere. It's not going to lean on any side. So don't ever bring in slenderness into this picture. Because slenderness effects has a definite meaning and they are when? When you have a pencil-like structure, not when you have a solid structure. There is no slenderness. But perhaps you mean something else by that term. What do you mean? Sir, as far as the compressive stress is concerned, the cylinder will have more resistance because more material is participating. Oh, by using vertically, it has more material. Yeah, more Equilibrium more demands, if I apply P here, <coughs> and P here, any cross-section, it's P. It's only the area of cross-section that matters. Once we remove slenderness out of the picture, so you divide P by that area. You agree? Strength of a material doesn't depend on the shape. Any other answers? And in great detail. You'll find the cube strength is more than the cylinder strength, approximately 25% more. Or you could say, and there's a standard terminology used, which say Americans like cylinders, uh, the rest of the world at least like it's cute for strange reasons. So they use F dash C, they call it specified strength. And we use FCK, characteristic strength. So rough correlation, F dash, either you say FCK is 1.25 F dash C, or you say F dash C is 0.8 FCK. Rough, you could get plus or minus something. Why? Because concrete is notorious for its very Right. So you've got both these. Which do you think is a more correct estimate of the true actual compressive strength? Cylinder. Cylinder. Why? Because the friction is developed. Right. Because of many reasons, but mostly, Cylinder strength is supposed to reflect more correctly the true uniaxial compressive strength. But before we get into that, let's look at what is called size effect. Let's take the same cylinder, and that's where we don't, we don't say slenderness. We say size effect because they are still ped pedestals. They are not they are not compression members which are slender. The size effect. Is, supposing I choose. So somebody decided this should be 150 by 300, right? What if I make it 150 by 100, 150? So either I keep the height the same, I change the diameter, I get size of it. So here we will we will keep changing the diameter, 150, 300, 450, 600, 750, 900, and keep the same ratio height to diameter too. So it's just size. Somebody said choose 150 mm cylinder. What if I choose 100 mm cylinder? What if I choose 200 mm cylinder? It's good to know. Will you get the same result? You don't. You don't. Why is it? And this is true of all materials. When you increase the size, when you increase the size, you get less strength. Increase the size, you'll get this. If I have more students in the class, you let in more students through gate exam, bottom 
I'll lower the percentile, I'll get less average quality. It's true in everything in life. Isn't it? Why? When the sample size increases, things go down. Why? Especially in mechanical uh, behavior, you find that you have the possibility of more defects creeping in. Always failure happens at a defect location. The larger the size, the greater the possibility of a defect manifesting. Okay. So then uh, how you will interpret the specific data for the actual bridges or? You have to establish correlations. This question is very good. That is why we have standards. He said it has to qualify standard. So if all of us agree to one standard, we all say 150 mm, then we have to link the size there with the size. We'll take care of that. But right now, let's test in the lab one standard. Whether you are in US or in India, let's all test with 150. Is that fair? Otherwise, you won't be able to judge. If here we test 300 and there they test 150, you can't compare. So a lot of studies have been done. This, we've shown a smooth line, but this also will have scatter, mind you, because there's been. So the standard is 150 mm diameter with uh, height to diameter ratio 2. And you'll get this trend. Now, interestingly, if you change the cylinder to a cube and you do the same thing, it's a 150 mm cube, you have 750 mm cube, you will get roughly the same trend. That's interesting. Because we are normalizing this with the strength that you get for the standard specimen. <coughs> so the moral of the story is whatever shape you take, cylinder or cube or prism or whatever, if the size of the specimen, the volume increases, then the chance of defects coming in are more. You will get a drop in strength, but it kind of tapers off at the lower end. Okay. Beyond a certain size, it doesn't seem to. So it can vary from about 15% less to about 10% more than the standard. Not beyond that, not too much. Beyond. Then we look at the height of the specimen. So you've got short specimen, you've got tall specimen, and we keep the same 150 mm diameter and we change the height to diameter ratio. The standard is 2. If the height to diameter ratio is small, you know, putty thing like that, Cooper, then the strength shoots up enormously, 80% more. But if I increase to three. See, three is our limit, pedestal. Then it drops slightly. Right? About 90%. This is another interesting phenomenon. Why is this happening? Yes? Saint Venant's principle. Saint Venant's principle. So two answers were given, both are correct. First is what is called platen restraint. See, you don't directly load the cylinder. You have to put a steel plate on top. It's called platen. And that is what transmits through bearing the, the load to the cylinder. Now, unfortunately, you can't make this frictionless. So you are actually, this will like to bulge out, Poisson's effect, because you're applying a load there. The strains here, it wants to have lateral increase in strain, poison effect, but it's prevented from bulging out here and here due to friction. So without your knowledge, you are actually applying not a pure uniaxial state of stress, you are applying a lateral confinement at the top and bottom, whose effect will spill over some distance. And that's a beneficial effect because it's also compressive, it's inward. You are actually subject to kind of a little biaxial compression in the top region and the bottom region. But, St. Venon's principle comes into play. Okay, what is St. Venon's principle? There has to be a certain distance for the pressure to, to be a balance, to have the same pressure. St. Venon's principle. So let's put it simply. 
let's say I have a specimen like this and I'm subjecting it to some load, keeping the center line the same. If I cut a section anywhere, I assume that there is a stress which is uniformly distributed between whose resultant will also act like this. But intuitively we know that the uniform assumption can happen only some distance away because in this region, probably this region is likely to be unstressed. There's some flow, there's a dispersion that takes place, there's a concentration. Here you will have very high local stresses. Well, same men and gave a thumb rule. This disturbed region where you really can't predict the exact nature of stress will be rough. That's a very good rough engineer's approximation. The same as the lateral width of which it is happening. So beyond, let's say this distance A, beyond A you can safely assume it to be uniformly distributed. This is this also goes it also goes to say that it doesn't matter how I apply the load. I could apply the load as a triangle. The same thing holds good. I could apply it uniform. Doesn't hold. The same thing holds good. Okay, so because of this, we'll stop it. Because of this, uh, you're uh, you're getting a beneficial effect in the cylinder, which you don't get in the cube. Sorry, you get this in the cube. So here the size is kept as two times because that effect dies down here in the middle. So you get in the middle region pure uniaxial compression. So we optimize the size of the cylinder. So 150, 200, you'll get it'll fail at the weakest location. But in the case of a, so this beneficial effect will die down. But in the case of a cube, it's one is to one. So that beneficial lateral confining effect will last throughout the depth so it will increase the measured strength and suppose to increase by about 20 and it will cave in the way we discussed right stop here thank you